I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zeiss Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Arcane Welcome Mark. Welcome to the show today. Today, we're going to be talking about environment and exploration. So by environment and exploration, uh, what I'm talking about here is generally uh, exploration mode is sort of where I was starting with this. The idea of, you know, portray but it doesn't necessarily have to be exploration mode. It's more of the idea of portraying the environment in a way that um, distinguishes the PC surroundings and uh, shows where they are over a longer period of time. So this isn't just um, just that one encounter thing where it's like, oh yeah, you know, you're in a forest, so maybe there's a snare trap. This is also about how to create the ambiance of uh, being in an area. So um, one of the first things that I like to do when I am setting something in an environment is um, do some research about um, what sorts of fa factors may be in play for that environment in in real life, if I'm not as familiar with that biome, um, to get inspiration on the kinds of things that the PCs might run into. Um, so with the, uh, with the world of Galarian, where I do most of the work that I do, um, and Alucar also, you can use the same kind of thing, where uh, since it's not a, a vastly different uh, planet, uh, the world of Galarian is canonically like the exact same distance from its sun as Earth with like the exact same size and all that kind of thing. So I like to look for places on Earth that may have a similar biomes and a similar climate to figure out some information about that place. So I might be able to figure out, okay, you know, what might the temperatures be like at this time of year in a place that's approximately that latitude um, and approximately that type of biome, what kinds of, uh, what kinds of animals might live there? You know, it might not, I might not be taking like, oh, it's literally the exact same kind of animal, but if I, but if I'm seeing that, yeah, you know, this particular biome would generally, you know, is harsher and would generally only have like smaller animals or things like that, or, you know, this is the kinds of plants that can grow in this kind of area that can help to, to decide like what kind of wildlife you're going to have, because, I would say that, you know, the, the life and the weather are both really important for getting a sense for, uh, for what it's going to feel like to be in that area and what kinds of challenges are going to be appropriate. You know, oftentimes in a, in a fantasy setting, you're going to have things that might take things up to 11. Like maybe you would have a place that deals with rainstorms and floods in, uh, in real life, but then your fantasy version of that is going to be more extreme. Or, you know, you might have a place where, um, a lot of animals in real life have evolved, you know, certain defensive mechanisms. And so you might be saying, okay, yeah, you know, I see that, I see that the, I see that poisons are a common defensive mechanism in this particular environment in real life. So, you know, what if I have a creature that has some kind of a ridiculous poison? And that helps to give a sense of, um, the, the sights and sounds and experiences as well that the PCs will have that aren't directly combat related. You know, what... What does it sound like in this area? What kind, are you going to have bird calls? What does it smell like? What are the kinds of things that, you know, dangers that the PCs are going to need to worry about in terms of like, is the ground going to be unstable? Are there going to be, you know, are there going to be diseases about it? So like what kinds, um, what, what is the PCs access to going to be to, uh, to food, to water, um, to light? Light is another important resource, you know, are the, are the PCs in a place where they're going to need to, make their own light? Are they in a place where maybe there might be, you know, and, and how does that impact the way that you're going to be running things? You know, if you're, if you're in a place that, um, has certain features, then the, the creatures that are there are all going to be adapted to those creatures, those features. Okay. So yeah. like you're, uh, you're doing something deep underground, you know, your, your creatures are probably going to have, uh, all have dark vision as a theme. And, um, you know, if you see areas that, and you're probably going to have to bring your own light. And if you have your own light, you're going to, you're going to draw a lot of attention to yourself. Or, you know, maybe you have, um, uh, underground creatures that put up some, or live near some kind of bioluminescence. And then that, that helps to, uh, helps to break things up as well. Yeah, absolutely. What is the area's, uh, ecology and history? Sometimes to understand the environment, 
uh, especially in a magical world where the environment may have had uh, magical connections, you want to understand its history. You want to understand the geography. Mm -hmm. Is it on uh, the windward or leeward side of a mountain? Yeah. Where do the rivers flow? But also magical where reasons. Yeah. Where do they flow in the past? So like there's uh, so like you know in um, in the Indigo Isles on the island that I that I was working on with stuff, there was a a canyon, and so one of the things that I was thinking about is. Where did this canyon come about? Why is it dry today? How did the how did the weather pattern shift and why? Because then when you have everything come together in that way, then it has a an explanation. It's more satisfying and it feels more natural. That's right. And sometimes they leave behind a mystery of of some kind. For example, uh, another example that Linda wrote in the Indigo Isles and it made it right into the new Kickstarter World of Battle Zoo Indigo Isles book in more explanation from someone who's trying to to figure it out and they have like four different theories mm -hmm. is that there is this desert that like you go like a tiny bit and you're suddenly in a jungle mm -hmm. and it's not a, a gradual shift and so it's like is the desert magic Mm -hmm. Did that just happen because the rivers dried out, um, or um, which may have been because of another magic thing that, but that caused regular geologic changes, or is there a magic effect on the desert? Is the jungle magic? Yeah. As the, and so like is is that the why it's still raining? Like is, is there's there's one theory that's in the book that someone who was trying to fix the desert wound up like attaching themselves to into an ancient Eldaman and they're like bound into the center of the jungle and that's why it's still working that way whereas there are other theories that the desert is under the effect of magic and no one is really sure yeah absolutely and that was really fun to work with too where you had a lot of environments that were you know working according to how real world environments work as you transition from like sort of the coastal environment into the salt flats and things like that that were inspired by you know research that i did and then you have this thing that breaks stridently and then i have a thing in there where you know pcs can attempt nature checks to figure out hey something here is kind of funky and then that can become a mystery in and of itself in the same way that like having a self-consistent story allows players to immerse themselves more with the story and the logic of the story having in a consistent environment does the same sort of thing also if you're not someone who wants to research every last thing about geology or climate you can always use magic as Mm -hmm. Your explanation for it is the pieces are like, wait a minute, this what this place uh, was this what way on the river, so shouldn't it have a different amount of vegetation than you said? Like, well, mm -hmm. magic. Magic, yeah. You can always you can always <laughs> go with that too. Yeah, you know, I think as long as you're you're sticking to portraying you know self consistent biomes in some way, so it's like you know even if it's a a biome that's that's very unnatural, still considering things like. You know, where does the water come from? Where does the food come from? What kinds of what kinds of plants and fungi can th flourish there? What kinds of animals might and what's their their general food pyramid look like? <laughs> Step one: research everything about climate. Step two: fix climate change, get Nobel Peace Prize. Step three: begin world building your TPRPG. Wait, you know what? <laughs> I think that Dustin's onto something. Yeah. That's probably one of the only ways to um, to um, start building your TTRPG and wind up with um, a decent amount of money. Ah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I certainly am not an, a climate scientist or expert of any kind, but uh, that's why I like to find... You could um, take the 10 million Swedish kronor uh, mm -hmm. that you get for the Nobel Peace Prize to use it towards your RPG. <laughs> that's why I like to find You'll real wind world up examples. with 1 million Swedish kronor when you're done with the RPG. Another cool thing about finding real world <laughs> examples is that when you research real world examples, you can get awesome pictures of what those biomes look like, and then you can show them to your players and be like... This is what this looked like. Or if you have a book that, for example, has a stupendously high art budget, then you can um, give references to your uh, to the people who are doing the art, and you can use that as well on your your maps. Because uh, art and maps are another real way to make the environment shine with the way that you with the way that you create the features. The environment is going to suggest certain things that deviate from sort of the standard. Hello there, friends. I am a flat plane battle map 
Um, That's right. Whether you have, you know, your your the environment will tell you things about what are going to be the variations in elevation. What what is going to create, you know, difficult terrain or greater difficult terrain or even hazardous terrain in the area that you're at? You know, are there things that the PCs might be able to climb? Are there things that are going to um, obstruct vision? Stuff like that. Yeah. So Dustin suggests you could use the Nobel Peace Prize medal as a hero point token. I'm, and you know yeah. what? Venture officers and like people with campaign coins that could use them as hero point tokens to help anybody at the table. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have official dispensation for this. <laughs> but I can trust that Alex would back me up on this if I said if you have you a, a Nobel, Nobel Peace, Peace Prize, Prize yes. and you come to my Pathfinder Society table, I'm going to let you count that as a campaign coin. <laughs> Oh for the God. purpose of using it to protect other people and give them a, a free hero point. Yeah, holy cow. Because I would just count it. And and I um, it, Alex could tell me if I was being a little bit too lenient on Nobel Peace Prize winners for that one. But I just think that like the spirit of the campaign coin is that you helped mm -hmm. out. And the yes. Nobel Peace Prize also probably helped out. Yes. At least <laughs> almost as much as the campaign coin winners. Oh my God. <laughs> So, um, back to environments, uh, there is, um, <laughs> there's nine main environments in the Pathfinder RPG, and you know what, you can split environments different ways in other RPGs, but these are pretty decent. So, uh, the aquatic environment is one of the environments that is, like, the most difficult, because it's three-dimensional all the mm -hmm. time, and everybody's swimming, and they can go whatever And not everything direction. that the PCs have is necessarily going to work as well underwater. There's visibility, also the question of visibility, there's breathing. Currents and There's mobility water. as well, um, yep. and how the PCs' mobility is going to compare to the mobility of things around them. Some um, of your items would, like, get ruined if you took yeah, them like, out. Mm -hmm. So like, you have to be careful with that. Like, there's other... I mean, like... Even other things like, you know, writing and, you know, what about your scrolls? What about, like, how do you, how do you communicate? You know, are you going to be in a position where you can speak without losing a lot of air? Are you, you know, are you Even going to be... Even if you can be, breathe, yeah. like, there's still going to be some issues with certain things. Like, are you going to drink a potion? Okay, mm -hmm. but, like, it's everything is water. Uh, do you have, like, a way to, like, attach it by tube and then just, like, kind of suck it in from that tube but is that going to take like, like more actions to, what's your to situation figure, to figure that sort of out yeah and uh and with currents and things like that too you know it's it it creates a new source of force movement that might be on the battle map um and that where your ability to swim can help determine things or you might you know if you're really not good at swimming you might be sinking um so that environment's gonna you know, you generally are going to need some way to prepare for, for those kinds of challenges. And most of the time when you're in those environments, you're going to be facing against enemies that, that have a, a really big terrain advantage. So I find that uh, that when using aquatic environments, like you want to make sure that the players know they're going to need to go into them because that's definitely one of the things that can, can could hard stop a session where it's like, well, we literally don't have a means to survive underwater, so we can't continue. So, so if you have to go there for a fight, which is not what this episode is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you can do that. But exploration, you need means to stay down there. You're not going to be able to stay down there for a long exploration. Yeah. And 3D makes a fight very annoying, but 3D also changes the way the exploration works because you have three dimensions you have to be able to explore in. First of all, that means there's a lot of stuff that fits in because it can mm -hmm. go up and down. Second of all, it could mean that the exploration that you expect people to do, they're like, okay... Uh, it's like the Futurama episode mm -hmm. where they, they, around the spaceship, they made like a peace ring where everyone was holding hands and the spaceship just kind of went up on the Z-axis and then flew away. Yeah. Uh, but similarly, you could be like, ah, ha, ha, look at this. I have this cool explanation. And they're like, okay, we'll go over it and then down. Yeah. So generally, if you want people to be exploring something in an aquatic environment, they might be searching over a long area for large area for something. Or if you have an enclosed space, consider how you can use that third dimension. Um, one of the nice things in aquatic areas, too, is to have some subsections within the aquatic thing that do have pockets of air that have other things going yep. on. Because and you can that have can create, sea caves that, yeah. that take away the third dimension somewhat because you're digging it underground in the same way. Yeah. So if you have, like, an a area that has air in it, first of all, that can give your players an easier place to rest and recuperate if they're in the middle of something that's like kind of a longer uh, longer 
water exploration. Um, and also that can be a place to have sort of like a, have things that maybe wouldn't have survived underwater, but then they can find those and they have to figure out how to get them out. So if you're saying, yeah, you know, this was a, this area was uh, above ground, but then it got flooded except for this area, that can be a way to, uh, to help drop hints and clues about what's going on and to, uh, to showcase the history of a place really, because, you know, it's really good, like you were saying before, to have an environment that shows its history. That's right. And where it comes from. So in an Arctic environment, those environments, you're going to have to be dealing with, it's constantly cold. If you don't have the right gear, you could be winding up taking cold damage or getting fatigued. And the ground is probably like slippery or has snow that you might like mm -hmm. stomp into and or both. And it can be very difficult to move across. It. Yeah, practically speaking, like for the for the less severe types of cold, you can expect that the PCs are probably gonna buy their gear and their equipment to make sure that they are gonna stay warm enough for that. But if you get into more severe amounts of cold, then that's gonna be an issue. You may have issues where um, the the players are needing to deal with those um, those sorts of environments at night. Say, you know, it gets really cold, and then they have to deal with it for a certain amount of time. Uh, also, those kinds of environments may run into more challenges with finding, you know, food and non-frozen water and other resources like that. Um, when you do have an environment where, like, um, like the Arctic environment, where you may have somewhat of an ongoing challenge, uh, I find that it's, if you keep throwing the same thing at the players over and over again, then they can get bored of it. Like, if it's like, oh yeah, you know, roll a fortitude save every hour to see if yada yada yada. Um, instead having cases where it's like, well, you know, usually your measures are enough to deal with it, but in this particular case, you run into a situation where this is too much and you might need to do like a skill challenge to figure out how good of a job do you do at building a shelter. And that determines how, or how, it determines how long it takes you to build a shelter and thus how much cold damage you take for being out. And then other than that, you may have, you may have a conversation with your players about the general strategies that they're going to use to, uh, to face against the challenges that they see. So, you know, it may be the case that the players ventured out into the desert and the first time they didn't bring enough resources and so like they had some challenges and so then they, they the players are, you know, the characters are talking to each other about, okay, yeah, how can we how can we handle this? Maybe they go back to town and they pick up some other resources because they realize they weren't correct, quite ready or maybe they come up with a cool strategy that they can use going forward and then, you know, you can assume, okay, that's a pretty good strategy. So as they're traversing the land, you know, they get they get through for like a week where that particular thing that they planned against wasn't an issue. But then something about the environment changed and it became an issue. So like, you know, they had gr a great plan for making properly insulated tents and they set those up and like, that's fine for a while. But then, um, but then, um, you know, they, the, why a wild bear s smelled some of the food that they had inside of their one of their tents and then in the middle of the night a bear came and was like trying to knock over their tent and so they have to drive off the bear before their tent gets collapsed or before they, their precautions are removed. So yeah, I find that generally with, uh, with those kinds of environmental challenges, um, finding a way to uh, represent those challenges as things that, that come up in um, interesting and different fashions. So rather than being like, hey, it's cold at night. Let's roll all of our cold at night checks again. It can be like, all right, we're going to roll our cold at night checks and, and we're going to have a plan. And then maybe something goes awry down the line, but we're then not going to roll that. Um, but then we're going to have an issue where there's an avalanche or then we're going to have an issue where, you know, there's where there's like an ambush from a, from a polar bear or then we're going to have an issue where there's some other or you're, you know, the snow is the light, the sunlight off the snow is really blinding and then that's going to make it harder for you to see and that might cause challenges and an encounter um and the, the, with the sunlight off of the, the snow thing like the environment doesn't have to be something that is super obtrusive it can even be as simple as hey here's a feature that's in the environment you know you can uh, you know let's do a quick saving throw or skill check to see how well you handle it and uh, that's going to impose some kind of a bonus or a penalty on your next encounter or that's going to mean something for a something that you're tracking such as uh, if you're tracking time to see how quickly you get across an environment to because there's a race against time if you're tracking you know resources uh, or anything else that you're tracking um it as long as like having the things in the environment have like a clear 
um, a clear benefit or, or consequence. Because uh, one trap that I, I definitely see uh, adventure authors falling into is where they will have something where it's like, you know, this marsh water is like really gross. And so if you, you know, if you accidentally drink some of it, then you're, you're sickened. Yeah, you know, you're sick too, or whatever, and it's like, well, that's great, but this isn't near any encounter, so there, it's pointless, right? Because by the time you actually get to the encounter, uh, it doesn't matter. So, well, I've played with adventure authors before, and one trap I've seen them falling into is a pit trap. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, so, uh, so one of the things that that I would would suggest for that, and this is one of the things that we've done in uh, in society adventures as well. Uh, hello, Kojo um is uh have a situation where it's like okay you assume that this is a circumstance that's around the pcs are succeeding at some of their checks they're failing at some of their checks maybe it slows them down a little bit but we actually only care about how well they're doing in the immediate proximity to the encounter so it's like all right you know what did you get yourself fatigued from walking around in the heat right before this right before this encounter took place or you know did you uh that, that sort of thing. So you're not actually assessing the state of the PCs, except for when you, you definitely need to for the, uh, for the encounter flow. Mm -hmm. So this isn't just Arctic, but I, it inspired talking yep. about some other stuff. So the next uh, main environment from Pathfinder 2E is a desert environment. So deserts have extremes of, of heat and cold during the day and night. They have all sorts of sand and sandstorms that, that happen um, in the desert. And uh, you, you better watch out for them. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know that they're going to hit you and you aren't prepared to take shelter, it can be a significant issue. Like, I don't know, my little brother went to the desert and he did not check the weather forecast for a sandstorm and he was trying to drive somewhere and he got stuck because there was a sandstorm and the sand piled up all over everything. So you, you need to watch out for sandstorms at any time. Mm -hmm. uh when you're in the desert that's in real life and in a fantasy game you also often see um deserts being used as uh, mirages being used in deserts um the idea of uh really vast distances that you have to traverse uh, deserts tend to have more things about like um endurance built into them for that reason especially because of the the swings of temperature that you need to be prepared for that's true. And uh, considering Whirlick points out, there are multiple kinds of desert, like Arctic deserts, which mm -hmm. are kind of the Arctic environment. Obviously, sand deserts. There's salt deserts, uh, which Linda wrote about in... Oh, and um, Kitchen points Indigo out, Isles. you know, the Mana Waste is like a desert with strange yeah. magic. Any it's of these kinds the of environments. It's got the Scar Desert. Yeah. Also, uh, the hotel that Paisalcom was at before the Double Tree was a food desert. So, <laughs> um, like... It was. There was like nothing. Yeah, it was I a know. 7-Eleven. And other than that, you had to go like two miles before you could find anything. It's, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of different kinds of deserts that are relevant to Pathfinder mm -hmm. players is what I'm saying. Yeah, but like in the, same, in the same fashion, like you wouldn't there want to. There was that one Denny's, yeah, but that was, Denny's, that was yeah. like pretty distant too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you don't want it to get monotonous by like focusing on that that too much, but like instead you can also simplify things down and then have like you have some days where things go fine and you breeze over those really fast, and then you have some days where where things go wrong. That's right. Um, so a forest environment is a pretty traditional one mm -hmm. that also includes jungles. Obviously, you've got visibility. There's canopies that are yeah. above. Trees are like in the way and you can take cover behind mm -hmm. them. There's bushes and shrubs and undergrowth all yeah, around. Yeah, if you're doing an encounter in a forest, really consider the third dimension. How can how can the forest inhabitants use that? Can they fly above the canopy? Can they climb a lot of forest and have it can they, you know, scurry down into a burrow to escape? A forest has a lot of places for uh, forest dwelling creatures to avoid being attacked or to take advantage of their terrain and their environment. You can also easily have, uh, as I alluded to in the beginning here, you know, snares or traps or other things hidden under the, the leaf cover. It's very easy to conceal things within a forest. Um, and then you, Mark was talking about uh, cover behind trees and things like that. Yep. You can have uh, difficult terrain with the undergrowth. You can have, um, you know, burrows where, where animals live. You, you can, can have, have leshies. A, you can have a large number of, you can have the the issue, yes, you can definitely have leshies. You can have the issue of identifying, you know, which plants are going to be, you know, 
toxic which you are you going to stumble into your poison ivy or are you going to find something that or are you going to eat the poison mushroom or are you going to find something that's that's going to work well for you um and this is also a place where you know having someone who knows how a character who knows how to navigate well can really assist you with the speed um with the speed of things uh, and you also want to consider with the forest like where's the where's the water um you know are there are there sources of water is it like more of a mountainous forest where you're also going to be considering changes in elevation or is it more of a, a flat forest what are the what are like the kinds of trees how dense is it is it like an old growth forest versus like a more recently planted forest all of those are going to have an impact on the way that the the forest looks and feels yep also you should be careful before you face off against a an elemental avatar of wood in a forest because <laughs> they're going to definitely have an advantage uh, so forests definitely are very traditional. There's all sorts of things you can they're do. They're also with them. A very. They're also the most traditional uh, in ha locations for plant monsters, um, and uh, it it really helps them to have places where they can move because plant monsters tend to be like pretty slow, and other creatures might be slowed down, but maybe they're not quite as much. That's true. So mountains are another um, great environment. There's. They are very just difficult to move about and not to the same degree as water because the water mm -hmm. has so much going on, but there's all these cliffs or like giant chasms or like rubble and avalanches. And there's the risk of falling depending upon where you are. Yeah. yeah. Um there's uh there's also if you get high enough, there's altitude to contend with and yes, more al more temperature sickness. swings. Um so that those are those are some of the things that you're going to be looking at there. Although mountains can also provide opportunities for uh, really great visibility. Um, it, so if the PCs are up on a mountain, that's a mountaintop. That's a great opportunity to let them see something in the distance that might be of interest to them. Um, conversely, if the PCs enemies are up on a mountaintop and the PCs are scaling said mountaintop, that's a great opportunity for them to get noticed. So um, so if you're climbing up a mountain. Um, paying attention to cover and how you escalate it may be, may be a value. Mountains can also easily be a place to get into uh, underground terrain by getting into caves. Uh, you can also have a lot of interesting stuff going on with valleys where they, you know, drier valleys, river valleys, things like that. Um, Absolutely. So plains are one of the simplest environments in general because they're often like relatively flat and you'll just see them stretching out in all directions like maybe you'll have things like hedges or fields of uh of grain or something mm -hmm. like that that Tall are in grass there. things like that yes uh or like undergrowth that you can take a little bit uh, a little bit of cover behind one of the main things to consider with planes is you know they're the kind of thing that comes closest to just here's your uh Oh, wait, um, it looks like there's a clarification on the Nobel <laughs> Peace Prize um, is that they do count as hero points, and Alex has, has tweeted that they do. That's so, hilarious. Um, I said I thought he would have my back on this. I, I know, Alex, I trusted him to have my back on, the, mm -hmm. on if I said I would allow a Nobel Peace Prize. I'm pretty strict yeah. about following the rules for Pathfinder Society, but in that case, I thought that was a fair um uh, so we now have a uh official word that if you do bring your nobel peace prize to your pathfinder society table it will count as a hero point but uh, you know nobel prize in chemistry forget it <laughs> <laughs> oh my god um so uh one of the things to keep in mind with that though is how that really open terrain impacts the way that you present things there's going to be very long visibility that means that uh, that means that whoever you're fighting in that area, you know, you're gonna see them from a really long distance, and they're gonna see you from a really long distance. So that's going to affect um, affect the way that battles play out. Certainly, you're not gonna have as much of an opportunity for uh, for stealth. Um, flying creatures become a lot more dangerous, and as as do creatures that are faster, because kiting tactics particularly if you do have really just a flat plane uh become a lot more powerful if you can't take cover duck behind a corner or force people to to come up uh to come up after you mm -hmm. yeah and rico points out that the economics prize in memory of alfred nobel is not an original nobel prize has an asterisk so it, <laughs> it might not count as a hero point i don't know we might need a clarification we might need to put that <laughs> i would put that person in a room with the other players and have them play prisoner's dilemma to see who gets the hero points 
if they solve it, then maybe they get one. I don't. Oh, know. I see. Maybe you can only use. They can only use it to earn check. income. Yeah, there you go. At the end of the session, mm-hmm. uh, I think. Can you even use hero points on that because uh, they're a fortune yeah, I think bonus that yeah. can't be done consistently all day? Yeah. But maybe anyway. in that particular case where maybe you, in that case you can. You got a Nobel Prize in economics. So, uh, so, so yeah. When you're when you're exploring on the on the planes. Um, this is also going to be one of the environments where uh, another thing to consider with exploring is like how well are you going to see the signs of those who came before uh, environments that have uh, a lot more dense things going on, like the forest where you might have uh, you might have like all the leaves and things like that. And like green places. mana. Yes. Or, or, or a mountain where you had mm-hmm. red mana, but the places plains for, you might yeah. have more white places mana. For, yes. Places for, uh, places for people to hide their tide or cover their tracks. How are you going to see like the signs of animals that pass through? Uh, rainfall is really important for that too. Um, because being able to track who's come before tells you a lot about like, oh, you know, are the people we're following coming here? Like, has anyone else been here recently? Does this place seem to be more abandoned? Whereas in some of your more indoor situations where we're coming into later, you can have tracks last for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And speaking of, of, of plains and forests and mountains, we also have swamp. Mm-hmm. And swamps are going to be one of your, yes. We can have sinking. Yeah, you, you have the amount, of, the amount of water that you have in a swamp environment. You're going to see, like, things generally rotting a lot faster. Uh, that's one of the things that, that I consider for an environment is, like, how long are the signs of someone being there? You're also going to be rot? wading through the water, but you yeah. probably don't have to swim unless the kids are pretty small. But you may also small. have things that are, like, if, like a peat bog that are, that are preserved in time for a very long period. You're right. That's another uh, trap that I've seen adventure authors fall into, which is a quicksand. Yes. Um, and obviously there's still undergrowth in swamps. They, uh, they definitely are something that you want to talk about all the senses. You want to do that with all of mm-hmm. these environments when you're in exploration. Like the mountains, you can talk about the crisp mountain air. Yeah, how does the air feel to breathe? What, the is, what, is, what does and it the smell The swamp, like? it's just like the humidity, yeah. the smell of the swamp, uh, the sound of croaking frogs uh, from all around you and insects buzzing. Mm-hmm. You can feel like you're in the swamp when you um, just sort of send all of your senses into that swamp. So, giving those kinds of descriptions, uh, giving those kinds of descriptions every once in a while as you're as the PCs are going through that area as you're presenting new sections, um, and sometimes the PCs will just riff off of something like you know, do you describe like a particular type of parrot or something like that, and the PCs are like, oh, I'm curious about that. I want to go investigate and see more about it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Sometimes things that you intended as a throwaway line, people will interpret meaning into, and then that gives you all the more reason to flesh things out. Urban is an envi- is another environment. This is one that we see a heck of a lot of in yes. uh, in our adventures. Um, urban environments are going to be very constructed. They're going to, you know, by definition, have a lot of history of the people who were there. There's going to be a lot of people. There's going to be a lot of people. Crowds There's going full to of be... people, doors and floors and walls and buildings and... All of those things, mm-hmm. and you're gonna have to, and you for for that you're gonna be considering, you know, how do the different groups of pe- social groups of people who live in that settlement get along with each other? What do they think of the PCs? Um, you know, what do they think of? Um, what kinds of resources are going to be available for the PCs? What are the what are the major threats to that settlement? What are the things that that settlement wants to achieve? What what are the kinds of things that people in that settlement might value or what are the kinds of things that they might think are like taboo or, or troublesome and how do the ways that the pcs present themselves interact with those beliefs yep absolutely so then the last environment is underground like ca- caverns mm-hmm. and dungeons you're definitely going depending you want to think about how how is this place connected like to is it a, a source cave? of fresh air is yeah. it is it is it constructed Mm-hmm. And yeah, where does the air come from? Are there vents built by dwarves long mm-hmm. ago? Is it just kind of stale and it just comes mm-hmm. in from? Is the there front? a risk of be of like a cave in where you might have to worry about about air supply running out? Mm-hmm. Uh, is the how does the amount of air that's been in this place and the exposure to sunlight and or lack thereof 
influence the way that the materials that are in here stay over time like if there is a if there are like oh there was a settlement that was down here and if there were people that are down here or there are you know how do they handle things with the cycle of day and night when they uh so like you have a lot of uh, a lot of underground dwarves in uh, in Golarion who you might who aren't necessarily going to be like oh yes our schedule is entirely based off of the sun that we don't see it's it's based off of that's right based off I of mean, other factors linda wrote one of the first like completely underground dwarf cities and put that in there and then it got expanded in um lost omens character guide and other places um for dwarves as well mm -hmm. um that when you're underground you have different situations going on plus if it's not constructed does your underground area always have enough room to stand up straight mm -hmm. are you crouching some of the time do you have to like get down and crawl mm -hmm. and how did and this is you know anytime that you have more constrained and more open areas considering how the how the the people the creatures that live there get around and how they use the space you know that you you wouldn't want to have a situation where it's like oh yeah well clearly these creatures live here but they can't actually make it through the tunnels whereas an area with like narrow winding tunnels might be perfect for smaller creatures who use it for defense against uh against larger more dangerous predators yep or and again that allows you to start getting the, these underground areas allow you to start getting into the third dimension a bit you may have tunnels that are above other tunnels or you know caverns that you can only get to if you climb or fly or things like that that can provide advantage to the creatures that use them absolutely then you can start talking about stalactites and stalagmites all around you. The sound of water dripping from the stalactites mm -hmm. down to the floor. The press of the walls around you. Obviously, make sure like nobody has claustrophobia before mm -hmm. you start telling them how constrained they are and how tight of the space is around them. And but... the PCs, like, if this environment is uh, one of the sort of typical ones that you might see for this is, um, you know, an old mine. If there's an uh, or something like that in terms of like a constructed uh situation are you gonna find like are there still gonna be minerals or items of value from that you know if people have used this space in the past what did they what did they use it for Mm-hmm. yeah cave moss algae mushrooms exactly absolutely what are the that's a good of, place yeah. to find leshies mm -hmm. um even in a cavern you can and are maybe there anywhere. are maybe there are places where where light does come in you know, I've seen some uh, like really awesome pictures of like, oh, you know, here's a cavern, but there's a place where there's a place where light can come in from above, and so there's like plants that actually grow there, and that sort of thing looks really cool. So mm -hmm. I like that idea. That's right. So the one thing that is not environment is an island. It's not an environment. It's not. A, it's not a single environment. An islands can have like... all of these different environments on them, like the Indigo Isles mm -hmm. uh, from the new Kickstarter uh, World of Battle Zoo Indigo Isles. So if you want your blue mana, you're not going to be able to find that in like a typical environment. But the other ones you can find um, all as standard environments in Pathfinder and in D and D and a lot of other games as well. Mm -hmm. So basically. You can see that there's specific tips for some of these environments, but the general tips always come down to thinking about the different aspects of the environments, making sure to find a way that you, the GM, as the conduit of the world, can describe the environments and help your players get into the environments and make them matter in some way. Like, you don't want the situation where you just said it was underwater and then that whole thing where they just go up and over it using the 3D. Mm -hmm. Make the 3D an interesting part of the exploration that's underwater. Uh, maybe an essential part where they have to go up and around and it's mm -hmm. three-dimensional Or if it, Yeah, they have to go up and around or maybe they're like, oh yeah, well we can just go up and over into this space. And then they realize, oh crud, uh, they set sentries that are above and are watching and will notice if somebody comes up and around. Right. Make because it anything an, that works in one direction will work in the other. Make it part of the story so that they really feel like they're in that environment for and that... It feels different than when they're not in that environment, basically. And um, if you do that, then ultimately that's the way to bring environments into exploration mode and make it really mm -hmm. sing to yeah. your players. And if you have any characters in your group that have like specific abilities that are tied to certain types of environments or terrain, that's a great place to start for thinking about what kinds of challenges you might want to, to throw their way. Because, you know... 
it really feels great when you're like, I took an ability to be good at this particular type of environment. And then like suddenly that environment comes up and you get to be awesome. Absolutely. I guess uh, one of the other environmental things that sometimes comes up is like, so it's not, not even like magical, but like, you know, oh, you know, now you're near like lava or now you're near like some other very extreme natural uh natural circumstances though those ones are more likely to be modeled with things like hazards because they just become so dangerous to be in or near Mm -hmm. so um i think that is about yeah. it for me what, i want to think about you have a few other yes, things yes i do so um this we've mostly been talking about uh natural environments yes. here um, in places like, you know, other planes or things like that, you can have environments that are ma greatly That's right. magnified. I talked about magical environments, I think maybe when I was, um, mm -hmm. advertising this and I, for we for I forgot to do more about them than just mention the spell. Yeah. Star, so it? you can, you can definitely have situations where you take something that is in real life as inspiration and then you like turn it up to 11 to really get across that feel. Like, you know, this isn't just a forest, you know, this is a forest where the, this is a forest where the trees are large enough to hold entire settlements and they and they go so high that like if you climbed this tree you would reach the top of the world or you know this is or this is you know this isn't just like a you know a a chamber that has uh you know a chamber that has like magma in it this is like the the opening to like the great city of flame and then you get these kinds of things that are going on um and the more fantastical you get, the more likely that magic can be the explanation for how things work. And in a lot of cases with those, the it's less about the, like, you, it's still good to have things be internally consistent, so there's a logic to them, but it's less about, like, faithfully reproducing things that could happen in the world and more about, let's just add extra thing. <laughs> I just see a skit. The crazy environment we have a lesser difficult terrain. Every other square costs one additional square of move player immediately leave to go adventure anywhere else you know there's there's a really i know it's it's a joke but it's also not a joke because you don't want the environmental features to feel like they're bogging down the the gameplay mm -hmm. That's and uh, when you have magic magical stuff going on there may be environments where like certain types of magic are more or less effective Yep. And that can really change the feel of... Uh, I feel like underwater the is the, the typical yeah. one where people always try to get out of it and go anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but extra planar environments can just be fun or weird. Maybe the mm -hmm. environment has special rules that just kind of make it more really unusual but interesting for the players to be in. You can mess with really fundamental forces. You can mess with, like, you can mess with gravity. You can mess with, like... You can mess with the way that sound propagates. You can mess with all sorts of things. That's right. And it can lead to some weird and interesting situations. Time can flow differently, although watch out for that. Yeah, watch out for that because when you go, how does that impact you when you go back to the, uh, go back to the regular world? I think one of the most effective time flows differently type things is, you know, sort of the temporary visit to a location that you then won't go back to and then you find that not as much time has passed as you thought uh, because then it's like okay you didn't really feel like you lost something back in the regular world but this also isn't a place that you can keep going back to and cheese the powers of time flowing differently that's right that's a very stereotypical good use of that but there's certainly there's certainly some interesting things that can be done um both in a good way and a bad way so think about your extra planar mm -hmm. location in the same way that we describe the natural environments. Yeah. Why is it like that? Use magical explanations to speak instead to time, of physical ones. In particular, uh, we had that's uh, one of the things that we have in uh, the changeling game that we have going on is that there's a, a realm known as the dreaming where time flows differently, and so you know characters tend to come back from that sort of at the speed of plot. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, okay, yeah, you know you're not going to necessarily, like, miss anything, like, major, but your character may miss some, like, minor opportunities to do certain things, but they'll be back in time for, like, the next big mission or that kind of thing. Right. So that way, one, you can determine why it works the way it does because it works based on the shared dreams, narrative, and stories of humanity. 
and so therefore that when you go into it and it's it has very variable time well it probably means you'll miss that story and it makes sense yeah you understand it because you understand the narrative of it just like if you understand by learning about physical climates you understand about the magic that makes your extra planner location work and use that to create descriptions again use all of people's senses use all of the same tips mm -hmm. you'd use for a desert or an ocean and you can make another plane something that like boggles the mind and is difficult to comprehend in real life be something that people feel like they can connect to and understand or at least understand well enough to play in it maybe yeah. you don't want them to completely understand it yeah and having abilities that work in unusual ways is uh, is a great way to go about that like whether a spell might be more powerful or it might function in a different way maybe like maybe like everything is lighter here and so it's much easier to climb but you know or like or or those sorts of things you can you can really play around with those uh those sorts of mechanics to make a place feel different it's like oh yeah you know in this place you know i light a basic match and there's like a big fireball and all fire magic is more powerful so like what does that mean for the way that people construct stuff <sighs> absolutely and what does that mean for you know both the things that the PC, the challenges that the PCs are really go, regularly going to face, what is considered to be normal in that location that is not familiar to the PCs, as well as how can they learn and adapt to that environment to be more effective moving through it? Because it's very satisfying to come someplace and then be like, oh my gosh, at first your characters don't know what to do, but then they figure it out. Mm hmm. And it sounds like Dustin's party is adventuring in Devourer Ravagug's belly where all timelines are converging using mysticism checks to oh, find nice. new timelines and counteract almost everything. Yeah, I mean, that can work. You just need to understand how and why things work in a certain way so that it can make, if not logical sense, then at least self-consistent story, yeah. story sense. So the players can rock it and make predictions and like make decisions and rather than just having yeah. everything seem because random if, because if you don't understand things to the point where they seem random then that takes a lot of agency away from the players to decide what their characters are going to do and direct their point them in a direction even if not everything will always work out the way they hope that's right so yeah basically that's how you handle planes it's the same way that we said there but there's a few other things to take into consideration all right. Um, is there anything else that now, we, now we I'm did done. miss planes? All right. So in that case, let's say goodbye to YouTube. And we have a few more things to say to all the rest of you. So stick around. Bye, YouTube. See you next time. Bye.